for our second day of the Cosmic Conference. I'm really excited about today's first panel. I'm Marilyn, the founder and CEO of Cosmic Centers, and I'm so happy to be here um, on our second day and fourth session. Uh, as you all know, the theme of the conference is centered around the future of work and specifically the impact of remote work on the post-pandemic world. This morning's panel discussion is one that is very close to my heart. I don't know if uh, many of you know, but I started off my career being an architect. Today's discussion is all about the workspaces of the future and the impact of the remote work movement on commercial real estate, particularly in the UAE. We know that companies are shrinking their real estate footprint, allowing their employees to work from home. Companies are also now considering hiring people in their own country. Uh, some refer to this as telemigration. This means that commercial real estate will continue to see an increasing mismatch between supply and demand, particularly possibly in a country like the UAE, where 84% of the population is made of expats. In this session, we'll dig deep to answer questions about the outlook for commercial real estate in Dubai, how property owners can adapt to new demand, but we'll also discuss what offices and flexible working space of the future will look like. How are they designed? What role can the government play in breathing new life into that sector? Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. As always, please feel free to like the video, uh, share it with anyone in your network that you think um, would find this conversation interesting. And please don't forget to ask your questions in our comment sections for our speakers. I will make sure that we dedicate uh, uh, quite a few you know, minutes at the end of the session to answer your questions. If you want to share about the conference, you can use the hashtag Cosmic Conference and do that on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, or anywhere where you want to share content. Content. Without further ado, let's get started. I'm really excited about the panelists that have joined us here today. Uh, first up, we have someone who I've had the pleasure of working with in the past. Ayman Youssef is the Vice President at Cold World Banker UAE, a leading provider of full service real estate in the region. He is a veteran of the industry and Cold World Banker and has been responsible for the growth and day-to-day -day operations for five branches and more than 100 sales agents in the UAE, including management, planning, and strategic development of the company. Ayman has led valuations and transactions uh, processes for several significant players in the region and was involved in plot transactions to a total sales volume of AED 2 billion. If that's not a man who has impacted the GDP of the UAE, I don't know who is. Also joining us is Amar Nakash. He's the founder and design director at Nakash Design Studio, a multidisciplinary architecture and design practice based in Dubai. In addition to this, Samar is the managing partner at Nakash Gallery, a Dubai-based interior architecture studio, an interiors gallery known for transforming spaces through iconic design, curated furniture, and art. We also have another panelist I was lucky to work with in the past, Omar al Mahiri. He's the co-founder of Let's Work, the UAE's largest community of workspaces. Let's Work offers affordable, flexible, and inspiring workspaces for SMEs. They're all absolutely stunning. I've been to a few of them. It's really a pleasure working from there. Um, for SMEs and freelancers and corporations across the country, Omar was selected for the E25 Entrepreneurship Program at EMAR, where he launched Let's Work with his co-founder, Hamza Khan. Omar is also a member of the Private Sector Youth Council in the UAE. I'm so excited to have all of you here with me today. Thank you so much for joining us for what I'm sure is going to be a really exciting conversation. I'm going to start us off with a really tough question, but you know, it's 11 a.m. It's the right time to answer tough questions. Uh, let's start with, do we think that the office is dead? And maybe I'll start with Omar because you, Omar Nakash, we have two Omars. This isn't going to be confusing at all. <laughs> yeah. uh, good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think the short answer to that question is absolutely not. Uh, I think this space will always uh, be required for human interaction. I think, I believe that the pandemic actually gave us an opportunity to question and redefine and experiment um, what, you know, the functionality of an office space is and will become. Um, I think time will tell, you know, I, I do believe that we're evolving into a much more tailored solution, uh, industry tailored solution to what offices are, but I, I think it's it's uh, it's a space that is required kind of for, for uh, creative connections and growth and um, 
Yeah, so I don't think it's going to die anytime soon. I definitely think it's evolving. That's that's a given, but I think it's here to stay. All right, let's see what Amar Mahiri thinks because he is a big challenger of the office space. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I would still have to agree with Amar Nakash. I think uh, the office is definitely not dead. You know, to grow company culture, you definitely need that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, but it is definitely developing into something else where we. Uh, as a startup, you shouldn't have to invest millions on on just an office space, right? Focus on what's what's ready and what you should be uh, investing your money in to get your product off the ground. And then when you reach a point where you let's say Amazon or Google, definitely the office is is, is like a, a pinnacle for that company. Um, I I have the pleasure of working with two different teams, one that's based here and one that's based in India. The team in India don't have an office, right? Everyone works remotely. It's been like that for the last two and a half years and we work great. Um, so I think it's dependent on where you are as a business, if the office is dead or not. But definitely after this pandemic, we have to really rethink where we put our investment in. If we need the luxurious office or can we facilitate with one meetup space and then just work remotely as we go on with our days. Brilliant. Ayman, what do you think? Are you having a hard time selling office space these days? Not really here, the, the situation, I totally agree with both Omar's, you know, like we look at data and we look from a global perspective at, at what's going on. And you will be surprised, Marlin, to know that in China, offices have done really well. Like we've seen an increase in demand in Shenzhen, which is equivalent to the Silicon Valley of, uh, in the US. And we've seen like, like an okay, uh, like, like, like demand, like a decline, but not too sharp in Beijing and uh, Shanghai. And in the US, they are at a historically uh, low vacancy rate. Like, like it's, it's not like COVID came and the office is dead straight away, not at all. So I totally agree with both of you that it's, uh, offices just will evolve to, to become a better place for people to come together and innovate. And yes, it, it will just evolve. So that's, I totally agree with both, yeah. So I want to probe a bit around this topic because I definitely agree that um, this the pandemic has made us kind of question what the office is going to serve as a purpose uh, and whereas we used to just say we'll go to the office and we'll get all of our work done there now we have to think about what work can be done at the office and and what kind of work can be done somewhere else i also don't think that the office is dead if that if that comforts us we have a panel that that agrees and the moderator agrees too but what i'd like you guys to maybe um, help me think think through is why do you think the office will still serve as a purpose? You guys discussed collaboration and coming together. Uh, can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Maybe Ayman, we can start with you. I believe that companies will, will try to strike a balance between remote working, but on the other hand, you want to maintain your culture and values, and uh, there is nothing better than human interaction face to face. I know that it varies from industry to another. I know it varies based on personal preference, but, but again, I believe that, uh, that the office will be focused in the future on, uh, on providing more like a, a social uh, element to the, to the corporate culture. And uh, more of what uh, Omar El Nehiri is doing in, in an outdoors, I think this will be like when, when I looked at Omar El Nehiri portfolio, I, it's amazing. Like, and I believe this will be the, this is how the, the future office space will look like. Well, actually, let's give it to Amar Mahiri. How do you think that co-working space can contribute to the culture of a company or does it take away from it? Um, I think what it does is, so when during the pandemic, everyone was working from home, right? And some people were okay with it, some people weren't. We did a massive survey just to see what, how people felt and the answer was 50-50. Um, I think besides building culture, the office definitely um, gives you that sense of separation between home and work. And for those that maybe don't want to put in money for, uh, for a fully fledged office, but just need a space to get out from, I think the office and co-working spaces serve as that differential between, hey, this is my work and this is my life. And getting the two mixed up together obviously happens to all of us, um, especially entrepreneurs and, and people who kind of run their own business. But I feel like the, if you're, let's say, a freelancer, the co-working space serves as a perfect uh, environment for you to work around people, right? Freelancing and startup is a lonely life. So I think that's kind of the biggest uh, 
plus for co-working spaces is the one the accountability the guy opposite you is working and you have to be working or are you just watching okay. something on youtube Very good point. right keep people uh, kind of kind of like the library factor right i'm working the guy next to me is working and i need to stay productive and then secondly it's 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 a nice difference to have right if you actually get up and go to a location you've done one thing right in your day instead of me getting up and sitting on my dining table and getting work done <laughs> you know maybe i'll be a bit lazy and a bit distracted so i think that was kind of our biggest push for these workspaces is there's always a workspace nearby and that's why we partner with these uh, great venues and that's why we have a lot of them around so that people have the option and have the accessibility yeah i think that's a very valuable point and i think those of us who are lucky enough to have that extra room in their house um to have a door that they can close and no kids that will come barging in we kind of underestimate the the value of that office as a separation i think that's a really excellent point um and particularly i mean whether it's working mothers whether it's um uh, people who just don't have the privilege of having that extra space the ability to create that separation is so essential to their performance i, I really think that's a great point Alma and Nakash, what do you think from an architect's perspective? What are the things that you think are going to remain as the core value of that space? Um, I believe that uh, the physical architecture has always been paired with the digital architecture. It's always been there and the office space has always evolved. And recently, you know, the open floor plan uh, and all these studies that they've done with the open floor plan, they kind of found out that it's actually counterproductive and it decreases human interaction. Um, I do believe that the office space, the future office space, will definitely be um, needs to coexist and compete with the virtual office space. And in the sense of it's more of an experiential uh, space for clients, for customers, potential clients, and to collaborate. So it's, it definitely needs to be kind of a hybrid between both, you know. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant point. I actually have a question for you a little bit later about yeah. that. Um, I have a second question for you guys, uh, specifically on the topic of, of Dubai, right? So I don't know, Ayman, if you'll confirm this. I've heard that um, sort of property prices outside of big cities around the world are kind of going up. And that's kind of a sign that people, um, now that they can work from anywhere, they might choose not to work from a big city. Um, and I wonder specifically for a city like Dubai, does that, as companies start to think like, oh, I can hire talent anywhere. They don't need to come to where I am. Uh, what kind of pressure is that going to put? And, and what do you think the government can do? Um, we recently saw an announcement that the Ministry uh, of AI and Digital will also focus on creating um, an, you know, remote work opportunities. What do you think the future is there? Okay, so I can, uh, I can comment on your, there are global trends towards the suburbs and the outskirts. Like, like for the first time ever, we're seeing the U.S. The uh, the office spaces in the outskirts outperform the, the the city, and this is something never happened before. So, so I totally agree with you. And on the residential side, there was a surge in demand for villas in uh, in Dubai here in Dubai, and so so people are willing to give up uh, a two-bedroom apartment in the heart of the city and to go at the same price for a four-bedroom villa where they can set up their uh, their home office and have a backyard, etc. So the trend is ongoing as we speak right now. And back to the talent uh, in Dubai here and on the employment, I believe that this will not be 100% applied on Dubai because we are a service dominated economy, which means the majority of the economy comes from hospitality, FMB, and then you have uh, trade, and you have logistics, and you have airlines, and then you have uh, uh, like like the components of the of, of the of, of the economy itself might need someone to be physically there to mm -hmm. be able to provide this kind of service. So it will have an impact, but not to a large extent. But that's that's my take on the on the. But it will definitely help because even now, even before COVID nineteen, if you call. Uh, most of the call centers here in Dubai, it's, it's actually not in Dubai. You will find when you call it a lot or do it, you be transferred to India or to Egypt for a call center. So, so the model is actually there, but I believe that COVID just made us more comfortable with technology and made us more like, yani put this this whole digitization on like a fast uh, pace, I would say. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's a very valid point. And maybe the impact is mostly on, on knowledge workers and, and not on anyone who needs to be physically present um, in their workspace in order to perform. Aman Akash, you, you brought up this idea that architects would have to design both spaces. And Ayman is talking about, uh, of course, digital transformation. How do you see um, designing the office of the future to take both physical and virtual spaces into account? And what do you think architects can do to evolve their practice and to make sure that when they're designing an office, which is meant to represent the culture and the brand of an organization, they also um, care for the virtual spaces that are being created these days? Absolutely. I think that there are so many aspects we can look into from a interior architecture point of view. The first one is in terms of materials, you know, antibacterial surface materials. We can look into acoustics to kind of accommodate for the virtual spaces as well as the physical spaces. We can look into partitioning. We can even look into MEP and HVAC, which is the AC systems and having more filters, you know, to kind of have fresher air circulating. So there's many many different aspects that we can look into from a physical point of view to accommodate to both the virtual and the physical space i think also flexibility like i was trying to allude to earlier is a key uh, aspect in designing to accommodate like i said for different experiences i definitely think it's very specific to the industry like ayman was uh, mentioning and to the size of the company as well um, but there is no one right answer, right? I, I, I truly believe that, like I said earlier, that this is an opportunity to re-question, redefine, and it can only work, I believe, if you know the company um, has a design thinking approach and brings many different people together. Like I said, the MEP person, uh, the HR person, the architect, and they put a set of goals together and they experiment with different layouts, they experiment, and then they see which is the one that, you know, uh, aligns most with their objectives. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point. There will definitely be decompartmentalization between I'm an architect, I'm an IT person, I'm an HR person, and all of these people will have to, to collaborate and come together to create new spaces. Armar al now that flexible work is, is part of the norm for us, uh, what can you tell us about what your members have been looking for that companies now need to account for, whether in terms of how their space is laid out or the services that you provide? What do you think are the most important things that the future office, whether it's a co-working space or a company office, needs to account for? Sure. Um, so in general, our members, there I'd like to say there's two sides. Mm -hmm. The ones that like to go for the experience, go see a new space, and then the other ones that like to go for the convenience, so close to their homes, close to their kids' schools, or close to their, I don't know, just uh, anything like their gyms or something. Um, during the pandemic, during the lockdown, we actually got a lot of questions for people asking for their favorite spaces to be open. And what corresponds to their favorite space is generally the, the, the overall atmosphere of the space, right? We have filters that are in place on our app to show you if it's a lively place, if it's a quiet space, um, if it's a small space or a huge space. So the, the thing is with uh, Let's Work, what we wanted to do was give a diverse range of spaces that could uh, essentially be uh, a productive workspace. Uh, however, my productive workspace is completely different than yours. Um, so we wanted to keep that broad range. But in general, I mean good coffee, Wi-Fi, uh, good lighting as well. You don't want a closed off space just so that you can sit there for a couple of hours and actually enjoy the time that you're working. Um, as well as that, during the lockdown, we saw a lot of requests for a private space. As you mentioned earlier, um, I don't know how productive mothers would have been with their children running around. So what we did with the, in partnership with the Rove Hotels was we actually converted some of those um, hotel rooms into private workspaces. And we've seen a lot of popularity just for people to just get out and have that extra room, as you mentioned. Um, as well as that, uh, we actually managed to work on a new platform for people to book instant meeting rooms and book uh, private offices. So soon we'll be listing more offices onto our platform. And uh, these will be bookings that people can make within a day or a week or a month, just because you need that kind of balance where I need a private space and a public space. And uh, we really feel like uh, supporting people like Eamon just to, to get some footfall within their offices, potentially during this downtime. 
Yeah, I think actually the, the move to rent out the Rove rooms as a private uh, working space was quite brilliant. Uh, kudos to that. I really thought that was so smart. Um, yeah, so and actually, yeah, sorry, go ahead. It's for the team as well, not just me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody gets credit. Obviously, it's always teamwork, but that was a really smart pivot and an excellent way to use hospitality space, which obviously, could, you know, had no clients at the moment at that time. Actually, Ayman had also written a question for you when we were preparing for the session. So maybe I can keep you with me for a few minutes longer. And, and he just wanted to know what were the regulatory challenges and restrictions um, that the co-working concept is facing in Dubai? Are there any like licensing, visa, labor law, anything you can tell us about how the regulatory space is evolving there and whether you think the outlook is positive? So um, when we first started this, the uh, freelancer license was introduced, which was a huge, huge success. I think uh, from the government side, they kind of finally realized that a lot of people just want to work for, them, for themselves and they need access to bank accounts and to uh, just general kind of admin tools that would help them kind of get going. Um, did they need an office? Probably not. And we've actually worked closely with the DED to just see that kind of progress that's changing. Um, I'd like to say they are very forward thinking in that sense that now you can actually sign up uh, through the DED for an instant license or mm -hmm. a uh, e-trader license without actually needing a physical location for the first year, which is great. I mean, um, as I said, I think people do need an office later on when they grow their team, when you want to be around people, when you start getting those core people who need to be in the office. Um, so I think they kind of give that leeway for people to be able to um, get a license and get started, actually generate some revenue before putting in some investment into an office. And one last point on that, the co-working spaces, um, they released the co-working license too. So a few of the spaces that are around Dubai, um, they have a license to actually say, hey, we're not going to give you an office per se, but you can actually get a license per the chair I have in my space. Yes. So uh, the government are very proactive with this thing and they do, uh, they do see that SMEs are a big, big chunk of the uh, the economy here, especially in Dubai. So how 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 much further can they support them? I think they're doing a great job with that. Yeah, I mean, it's always impressive to see how fast the government here moves and regulates things in order to sort of support progress. Yeah. On that note, Ayman, I have a tough question for you that Omar Nakash um, put in our list. And, and he asked, I mean, this is going to be a really difficult one, but try to give it a shot. Uh, he asked, what's the expected forecasted supply? Um, <laughs> Of real estate in Dubai and and how much of that will be specific to the office space but also um, how much has the pandemic affected the development of real estate in Dubai is it a change that will last and and what role can the government play uh, in order to sort of weigh in yeah I, I really like the question but it's I uh, it's the challenge is to sum it up in a couple of minutes okay but I can give the overall idea uh, Dubai in, uh, in the offices and in residential and retail have been going through a downturn for the last few years, which means the prices are declining. Like for offices, for instance, grade A office space uh, and the office spaces in general have declined 15% uh, year on year when we compare Q1 2020 to Q1 2019. So COVID just accelerated the pressure. But but it's uh, but it's uh, it did not like fundamentally have like like a massive change on how how the market is is performing. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, in in the real estate, the way that I look at COVID, it's great news for uh, for re for the real estate market because I've been always supporting the fact that the demand needs to come under control, I, not the demand, the supply. Right. So in supply, there were, there were excessive launches by, by, by some major developers in Dubai and it was going, they've done an unbelievable job, including ourselves, that we had to reach out to international markets in China, in the GCC, and we were really successful to generate a new demand and still real estate in Dubai is relatively very attractive compared to the rest of the region. But on the supply side, the situation was a bit more than where it should have been. So, COVID gonna going to have positive impact on two areas. Uh, first of all, the supply, we're going to see that we, we, gonna, we have really a big backlog of, uh, of supplied units which will come, but this will have some sort of delays. Like, like we're going to see instead of having 60,000 units or more, mm -hmm. When this will be phased out, and maybe in my in my personal prediction that this will be phased out in 
in maybe the next couple of years. And on the other hand, we're seeing that in the offices, the majority of supply happened already in the last few, uh, few years. So on, on the office supply, we're running at uh, 9 million gross leasable area, 9 million square meter gross leasable area. And we're expecting this year 310,000, which is not like a significant uh, supply coming in. That's, that's on, the, on the office space. But the offices, uh, to give again my, my, uh, my thoughts on how the offices are performing, we cannot uh, talk uh, about the offices as a whole because uh, th there are different signals like, like you see for instance they've done successfully well they've done really well like, almost full occupancy if you look at cbd they've done better than the office space so so there are certain areas in dubai are really suffering under severe pressure i'm talking about the office and certain areas have done fairly well during the last two years and moving forward i expect that we're going to see a further correction in all the asset classes in Dubai. And, uh, but, but we are at the bottom of the cycle. That's, that's my, my prediction. Like, like now, is in general, like, like from a real estate perspective, now is, is, is a better time to buy. And it's not a great time to sell if you have the whole... I think we are losing Ayman. That's okay. I think he kind of did a great job trying to answer that in two minutes. We can give him some brownie points for that. I think um, I want to ask Kamar, I want to ask you a, a, a bundle of questions. So actually, this is coming in from our audience. Nihal and Mark kind of asked the question that I think is very similar. So this is for Amar Nakash. Um, they asked, um, for a long time, office space was equated with prestige. Um, uh, Mark was saying that people who work in advertising are still noticing that clients want to meet in physical offices whenever relevant and that maybe um, you need to have the prestige of an office to sell, for example. I know earlier we discussed um, what some of the functions for employees is going to be in terms of the office, but I think the office will also serve uh, some function in terms of our relationship to our customers and suppliers. Do you still think the office is going to play a major role? Do you think a company that does versus a company that doesn't is more or less likely to win a bid? Um, I think there's there's the short term future and there's the long term future to answer that question as specifically as possible. I think in in the long term the perception of that will change eventually. They will allocate less importance to that. You know, to the uh, I don't think you know it, it will be a deal breaker. You know, and in the short term I, I still think people are learning as they go they're gonna they're gonna see i think that the the, the working uh, remotely has a huge uh, financial uh, implication for these mega corporations and they realize that they don't need that much space so from that space that's locked down for long-term leases maybe they might uh, reconvert them redevelop them into something that is more of a wow effect for their, their potential clients to, to lock the deal um, but yeah, I hope I answered the question before I started mumbling on. <laughs> no, I believe that you did. I mean, I definitely, I was discussing this with a friend recently. I won't, I won't name the company, but um, they were having a, an important meeting uh, with a minister. And I said, well, what does your background look like? Are you doing this from home? He said, yeah. I'm like, well, do you have any, do you have a pin on your shirt? Like, do you have a background with a logo on it? Like, how do you make this minister feel the importance of walking into your space and collaborating with your company when you're sitting in your house wearing your pajama bottoms? Like, it's just, um, there's something about that, that that you just, I don't know how you can replace, right? And maybe one day we'll become so good at like, creating virtual twins of offices that like will live in a virtual space. I just don't see that we're there just yet. Um, but I, for me, that's a real question. When you're negotiating, when you're selling, when you're trying to make an impression on someone, uh, are you ever going to be able to do that sitting you know, in your room with your background and, and wearing whatever it is that you're wearing? There's something that comes from these physical spaces that matters so much. I think it's a, it will be a stepping stone toward, like, if you think about it, everything has gone digital. Like, even meeting someone, now you can meet them on the app, but at the end of the day, you still got to go out and meet them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's kind of that same mentality where you can 
meet them and have that first impression and paint yourself in the picture you want to present yourself to this potential client. But at the end of the day, the client needs to come and meet you physically and get a better understanding for themselves. Definitely. I think Amar, maybe Al Mahiri wants to add something to that. Or if not, I have a question from you from our audience, actually. Um, so um, someone asked, and, and I think that earlier on, you mentioned that part of what you were going to potentially be doing in the future is helping existing companies lease out their extra office space. I kind of heard that in between the lines. Um, someone in our audience is asking, do you believe that the COVID-19 effect means that you got more queries for co-working space than you used to? And do you think that co-working will eat up the traditional business of renting offices in the future? I have to be careful to answer that last part, otherwise Eamon might get angry. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I mean, um, definitely we, so when the lockdown happened, obviously we, we shut down all our ads, uh, but the request kept coming in specifically because, I mean, the, the harsh reality is people did downsize their teams. Uh, I, I'm sure everyone looked at their expense sheet and just said, okay, this is what we don't need, we don't need. How do we kind of survive this, this uh, love? Um, so yes, there was a lot of requests and even um, Hamza and I actually held a, a round table for all the different co-working space providers just to see what's going on and what everyone's plans are, just so we're all on the same page. Um, and everyone did mention the exact same thing. Everyone is getting these random requests from big companies that are saying, actually, we're going to downsize a little bit. Um, and also for the other part where people are trying to separate their teams just to be safe you know you don't want all of your finance team in one space mm -hmm. let's say god forbid uh, an outbreak happens through them then your whole finance team is out so i think it was those two things right uh, downsizing and then just separating people as much as they can um but i don't think it will eat up the traditional office business i think if it, it will support it right um we've seen this kind of change we've had um, an hr team since the beginning of uh, our launch it was the two founders together uh, after six months, they grew to five people. After that, they grew to 10. After that, they grew to 15. So when they reached 15, they wanted to be together. And we simply said, great, I mean, we, we love you guys to come stay with us. We'll give you some passes that you can use. Uh, but it's time for you guys to graduate and go to an office since you've actually reached that potential. So I think co-working spaces will definitely support and, and kind of introduce uh, more people into that top funnel for the traditional office spaces, for sure. Yeah, I agree. And definitely size matters. I mean, we, we, we tend to think of, oh, a few employees here and there, but when you have a thousand employees to manage, it's, it's complicated and not to mention issues of security and health. And yeah, as you say, um, redundancy. I mean, these are very complex things that um, companies are having to deal with right now. Uh, there's a question for Omar Nakash in here. So Eli asked, um, uh, hi everyone. Do you feel that in the new design for the offices, the open plan and collaborative areas will still exist? Do you think the architecture is going to change? Um, like I mentioned to earlier, I think it really depends on the organization and the culture that that organization, you know, wants to wants to create. I think what's funny, and Ayman, correct me if I'm wrong, but these big mega corporations, multinational, who kind of have the cash flow to bankroll um, their their employees through this downturn for the next 12 to 24 months they're actually going to need more space because they need to actually social distance. You know what I mean? So people that are not letting go of employees actually will need more space to kind of spread them apart. Uh, but again, going back to the question asked, I, I, I think, um, you know, the open floor plan really depends on the culture of the company. Uh, it really, you know, studies have proven that it, it decreases uh, human interaction and digital interaction is increased to kind of uh, compensate for that. Um, but again, it depends on the industry, depends on the size, depends on it's, it's so many different factors, but I definitely think there will be need for collaborative um, spaces. And I definitely think collaboration increases with face-to-face -face interaction. Yeah, that's a very valid point. I recently read something about the open plan design for offices uh, that I think is a really interesting historical fact. But essentially, um, people started needing to be co-located for work uh, during the Industrial Revolution because there were all these machines and factories 
and then people had to congregate around the machines, right? You can't do that remotely. Um, and then as more and more factories started being built inside cities, you needed people to manage them. Uh, and the early design of office space was made to mimic the, industry, the factory floor. So what you had was you had rows of desks for clerks, which actually mimicked where the machines were. They were all facing the supervisor which is what they would have been doing on the factory floor. And that's how like the manager overseeing the work of the employees kind of came to be. Um, and I think that that's where the open space concept really comes from originally. And, and it's, it, I definitely agree. I mean, maybe some companies will insist to maintain that. I think definitely if you're in a, in a industry that is very highly regulated, where security is really important, whether it's like banking or even architecture, because I mean, if you're building, a, I don't know, a super tower, it's a very complex legal process, right? Um, so I think in some of those industries that'll remain and maybe to your point, yes, Ahmad, and that answers a question we had earlier from Aboudi about whether um, workspace densities would change. Maybe then, yeah, you have to keep bringing everybody in, but then separate them a bit more. Um, and on the opposite, if you're if you're in other spaces, maybe that concept just dies away. And this idea of the manager overseeing the employees just completely shifts and maybe even just becomes completely virtual. I think Imad also asked a really beautiful question and, and a very complex one, and I'm going to read it out loud. So he says, as the result of the pandemic and remote work, uh, whether it's temporary or not, we have a new reality. And do you see, and maybe Ahmad Mahiri, that's a good question for you to pick up. Uh, do you see any analogy between what e-commerce did to malls and retails? And how do you think that'll be mirrored into office space and remote workspace? Um, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. Um, so yeah, the whole e-commerce and uh, traditional brick and mortar retail was is, is a huge, huge topic of discussion, right? Everyone has their own opinion on it. Um, I personally think that they also they help each other right because um during the pandemic the the, the shops that survived everyone went online um yeah. and it just kind of pushed everyone to go towards that that necessary future um i think how they correlate um as i mentioned before yes they will definitely support each other in, in that kind of growing but also to touch on one of the comments i saw it it does help that kind of lifestyle there's some cities that have experimented, and some companies, sorry, that have experimented with a three-day work week. Um, mm. with, with my team, what we're doing is we're working from our spaces uh, three times a week, and the other two, you can work from home. I think that gives everyone the kind of balance to, you know, we've been doing this for months and it's very hard to break a habit. Uh, everyone got used to working from home. Um, I think if, uh, if you have a traditional office, and remote working has already been initiated and there's not you don't need to see your employees every single day right you've already kind of proven it during this lockdown so i think they kind of help each other in the sense that um, you'll be able to trust your employees more and i think efficiency comes out of it right people aren't sitting there wasting time chit-chatting with each other you finish <laughs> your work the day you have a task list and you're done um, and you can spend time with your kids, you can spend time doing whatever you like to do in your own home. Um, so I think they will definitely support each other. How the, the retail side, that's it, it's a lot more complicated um, than that. And I, I don't think I can comment uh, to say, but maybe I'm going to flash that something. Yeah. I just, I just want to add the, the analogy. Uh, there's a lot of um, misconception about the percentage of retail that's online versus brick and mortar so i just did a quick search because i read this a while ago so i didn't want to throw a statistic that was incorrect but 10 percent of all retail purchases in the united states last year were on e-commerce yeah so that 90 percent were still brick and mortar so yeah. if we look at that analogy and implement it into the office space obviously it's growing and the virtual office space will grow but at the end of the day I think you know humans are 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 very um, interactive people, you know, <laughs> and, and the face to face uh, cannot be replaced. I definitely think we will lose in terms of percentage, and that will grow. E-commerce maybe in 2050 will accommodate to 20 percent, 30 percent. Nobody knows, but still, the fundamental uh, brick and mortar will remain. So going back to that analogy. 
Yeah, I, that's definitely that's true. I I I I know the same statistic as you, and I think the the difference is just that people tend to focus on things that are growing and things that are slowing down. Uh, but it's also always interesting to take a step back and look at the actual global numbers. And yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I don't think retail is dead. I don't think the office is dead. Um, but definitely, we we are in a phase where we can re-question what we use these spaces for and, and how we utilize them. And actually, I have a professor who's joining us for our closing debate um, uh, this afternoon at 4 p.m. He says, uh, we didn't learn to hunt lions in the savanna on Skype. Uh, and I always think that's a great way of saying, like, human beings don't actually evolve this fast. Our DNA is still, you know quite uh, deeply ingrained into us and our DNA tells us about how we collaborate, how we care for one another and how we form communities. Um, so I, 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 I agree. I think a trend is important to pick up on. It's a great business opportunity, but it's not going to change the world upside down in five minutes, uh, definitely. On this wonderful note, um, I'm going to ask you the last question of the session, uh, which we ask all of our panelists. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to finish the sentence, the future of work is dot, 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 and maybe explain um, why you think that's the right word. Maybe, Amar and Mahiri, we can start with you. Um, I think the future of work is lean. Um, you really have to, to count every single term that you have, right? Um, I think we were in a great period uh, before COVID where everyone was just kind of, hey, we need this, we need this. I think stay agile. Um, we have the pleasure of working with many different startups, which are our members. And uh, it really hurts me when I hear them say, oh, we're going to spend 80,000 dirham on some software that they, they might use, right? I think uh, stay lean, stay agile, um, because as we've seen from this pandemic, anything can happen. And you really, 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 like, you need to put as much as you can to make it through these kind of things. And it's harder when you have a lot of assets that you're taking care of. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Paman Nakash, the future of work is? Uh, I, I'm debating between two words, to be honest, but I think I'll go with tailored. I think it's a very tailored solution, um, depending on your industry, depending on your size, depending on your growth strategy. It could be lean, it could be in an industry where you need that wow prestige effect, you know, so you need to invest in such a thing. So it's much more tailored. I think uh, the biggest thing is that it's, it gave us an opportunity to redefine what it is and experiment. And I think it's going to evolve into a much more tailored um, space. Brilliant. Thank you, Ahmed. Ayman, do we have you back with us? Can you answer oh, just in time for our oh, last question? Hi. <laughs> you hear me? Right? Yes, we can hear you. So, Ayman, the question is, the future of work is? I think the future is wo of work is, uh, if I may give two words, it's better. And I believe it's going to be like a hybrid model between digital yeah. and a face-to-face, -face, like uh, physical. It's, it's like we're going to have like a hybrid model, I believe. Yeah, that's a very valid point. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everybody. I really love this conversation. I don't know if you could tell how engaged I was. Um, definitely something that hits very close to home for me. Um, I really want to thank all of you for your ideas and your contributions and for joining us for our panel today. A huge thank you to our attendees as well uh, for being there. And, and honestly, I wasn't the only one who was engaged. Uh, our audience was also asking questions from the first three minutes. So that kind of shows you how close to home this topic is for everybody. Uh, some great insights. The office isn't dead. And we all unanimously agree that things are going to be hybrid, as Ayman just mentioned and that we're going to just evolve from the models where we are today. Uh, Ahmad and Heidi, you told us some amazing things about how co-working spaces uh, really helped create some uh, resilience for companies or safe spaces for others or separate us from our lives so that we have uh, the space to focus um, on our work. Ahmad Nakash, thank you so much for all your insights about the fact that, yeah, things are still going to be very different from one industry to another, from a company to another, and that the future is tailored and that we still need to ask ourselves the tough questions and there's never going to be a one size fits all for everybody. Um, thanks again so much for joining us. Before we wrap up, just a reminder, we have a competition on our website on the 
conference page for five companies uh, to get a free consultation with Cosmic Centaurs. All you have to do is go and fill out a form with one question. Tell us about an interesting work challenge that you're faced with today and, um, and how we can help support you through that. Um, I really hope our audience will join us back uh, for our second second session of the day. I know that's also a very um, anticipated session uh, where we have experts from the HR world, the branding world, the recruitment world, talking to us about culture, engagement, wellness, and the new normal and how we can take care of our employees, not just through the pandemic, but also when the world goes back to whatever is the new normal. We'll kick that one off at 2 p.m. Dubai time. And as always, you can find it streaming on both LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, Amar Mheri, Amar Nakash, Ayman, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute hoot of a conversation. Um, and it's just been such great insights. Thank you so can much. Can we just take a minute to thank our host and all the people behind this event and put together this panel discussion and connecting all of us. So thank you so much for the opportunity. And I can't wait to see what the future holds for Cosmic Centaurs. Thanks, that's very kind of you. We, we could work hard to put this together, so it means a lot for you to say that. Wonder, have a wonderful day and see everybody at our next panel at 2 p.m. See you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.